All right, let's do this. One more depositional environment, the marine depositional environment. So this is going to be this environment here. We talked about continental depositional environments, transitional, and now we're going to talk about marine depositional environments. These include areas on the continental shelf, the continental slope, the continental rise, and the deep sea floor. Um, much of the detritus, uh, solid pieces of sediment, um, clastic pieces of sediment, eroded from continents is eventually deposited in marine environments. That goes back to the fact I've said a number of times, the vast majority of sedimentary rocks, when you're looking at them, probably indicate some sort of marine deposition. That these The sediment was deposited in the ocean, that's what that indicates. So again, uh, much of the detritus that's eroded from the continents via streams or a number of other processes or eventually flow out into the marine environments. Other sediments are, are found uh, in the marine environment as well. So with uh, detrital marine environments, the gentle sloping area adjacent to a continent is called the continental shelf. The continental shelf, so once you get to kind of the edge of the continent, the beach, but just below the water, it kind of gently kind of slopes out. Right? There's a little bit of a, a gentle slope uh, out before you get into the deep ocean. That's known as the continental shelf. Um, it consists of higher energy um, inner part where the bigger uh, uh, sediments are typically deposited um, and periodically stirred up by waves and, and tides. Uh, mostly sand-sized particles um, shaped into large kind of cross-bedded marine dunes. But bedding planes are commonly also marked by waved formed ripple marks, those ripple marks that we see on the end of the beds and on the, on the upper layer of the beds as it transitions from one bed to the next. You can also find marine fossils in bioturbation. Again, bioturbation is biologic entities disturbing the sediment. So on the continental slope and rise, we'll, we'll talk about those two initially and then I'll break it up. The lower energy part of the of the continental shelf has mostly mud with marine fossils and interfingers as the facies end horizontally with um, kind of that inner shelf sand. So much of the sediment derived from continents crosses the continental shelf and is funneled into a little bit deeper waters through submarine canyons, and you get those turbidity currents that we talked about. Um, it eventually comes to rest on the uh, continental slope and continental rise as a series of overlapping submarine fans. Once sediment passes the kind of outer regions of the continental shelf, uh, uh, Again, turbidity currents uh, help to transport it. So graded bedding is common, as well as mud that uh, settled out from the oceanic water. Okay. So here we go. So we have the continental shelf. All right. So the inner shelf, you get more bigger particles deposited and staying there because of the high energy environment, sands and gravels. Um, the outer shelf, you're getting more of your silt and clay, but you can also get some sand material, um, some of the coarser grain material, as well as the small, kind of coming down these uh, submarine canyons and these turbidity currents to form submarine fans, which have graded bedding as they spill out onto the con continental rise. That's the, yeah. The, the bit that's kind of coming off of the continent itself. This is all continental crust. Um, I believe I mentioned this uh, in the past, but even though it's underwater for a portion, well, that's because weathering and erosion takes place. Waves kind of ground this down, so, but it's still continental crust ex that's um, underneath ocean water for a number of kilometers or miles before we get to oceanic crust. Beyond the continental rise, we have the, the seafloor sitting on oceanic crust. Um, this is where it's nearly covered by very fine grain deposits, very small grain uh, clay deposits, and uh, oozes. More on that in a second. 
Um, sometimes it has no sediment at all. It's just too far away from any sediment source. There's no sediment at all. Mid-ocean ridges out in the middle of the ocean on the seafloor. Sediment can't make its way from land all the way over there, so there's almost no sediment at all on these mid-oceanic ridges. It's all kind of rocky material. So sand and gravel, definitely not present. That stays closer to, closer to land. Um, the main sources of sediment in the deep ocean include uh, dust from continents or oceanic islands that actually get blown out and they might settle on the ocean surface and then fall down. So you might get airborne dust, volcanic ash up into the atmosphere that might settle over the middle of the ocean and then kind of settle down. But another big part of o deep oceanic sediment is going to be shells of microorganisms that dwelled in the surface water. So these there's microscopic kind of um, shelled creatures that live in the ocean, and as those things die, their microfossil shells just settle down to the bottom of the of the deeper oceans. Um, types of sediment that we find in the deep sea are um, pelagic clays, very small grained materials, which covers most of the deeper parts of the seafloor, but also calcareous and siliceous ooze made of microscopic shells from animals that have died and their microscopic shells sink down to the bottom. Um, calcareous is more carbonate. This is kind of a constituent of calcite and limestone and dolostone. Siliceous, that's silicon dioxide, quartz oozes. Um, some organisms extrude either this uh, calcite to create them sh their shells, some have uh, silica to create their shells. Um, so here's a little map that shows the, the kind of what the bottom of the seafloor is made of. So looking at the U.S., so as we get closest to the shore we have continental shelf deposits, so land-based sediment being deposited. Um, so not only there, extending out, then we get into the pelagic clays and then the calcareous oozes and the siliceous oozes. Um, yeah, and those calcareous and siliceous oozes are made up of these microfossils. If this represented one millimeter, you can see that these things are just a fraction of even of a millimeter. A millimeter is how thick your fingernail is, like how thick it is, which is not very thick at all. They only like that thick. And you can see that it takes a number of these things to even make a millimeter. So these microscopic fossils that uh, make these small sediment oozes that eventually turn to rock. Um, we also have carbonate environments. Carbonate rocks are things like limestone or dolostone, things that are composed of calcite. Um, limestone is similar to detrital rocks in some ways, and that's made up of um, could be gravel sized grains, could be sand sized grains, but it could also be microcrystalline uh, carbonate mud called micrite. Um, but all the grains are, are calcite. They're not um, uh, typically detrital uh, from, from land and nature. Um, in these land, limestone environments, excuse me, some limestone does form in freshwater lakes. Um, but for the most part, limestone is deposited in, in warm, shallow seas. So if you have uh, identified a rock as limestone, you can tell that's oh, just, just warm, shallow, oceanic sediment deposited that eventually made this rock. Uh, again, deposition for these types of sediments that make these sedimentary rocks occur where there's little detrital sediment. Um, especially especially mud is present so it's just mostly this um, either shell material or carb or, or calaceous or siliceous material um, and then we get these carbonate barriers that that form and rise from the sea floor in high energy areas that might be reefs so coral reefs are, are carbonate in nature the the shells the hard material of, of the coral animal is carbonate calcite in na nature. It could also be skeletal pieces, microfossil shell pieces that build up to form these carbonate barriers. Um, you could get accumulations of spherical carbonate grains known as ooids, uh, which make up uh, a, a type of limestone called, uh, what is it called? Oolitic limestone, excuse me. 
Oops, let me go back. So yeah, so again, we could get these reefs popping up, uh, this reef rock, um, variations of, of limestones that are created. So limestone equals a little bit uh, a deeper out marine environment. Um, some sub environments kind of touched on them reefs, um, carbonate banks, lagoons might sometimes also have carbonate environments. Um, if they are, if the water tends to be more marine versus, uh, if it's more marine and the ability for water to act on and within the lagoon versus protected lagoons like behind barrier reefs, which are going to be more um, smaller sized uh, detrital sediment consistency. Um, we also uh, have evaporates. So evaporates, if you remember back, water that has dissolved particles in it as the water evaporates away it leaves those particles behind they fall out of solution and we can get uh, rocks like rock salt and rock gypsum that indicates an evaporate environment they can be found continentally in playa lakes saline lakes salt lakes like the great salt lake in utah but most of the extensive deposits that we see of evaporates of rock salt and rock gypsum indicate somehow a sea part of the sea got blocked off and water evaporated away so they too indicate marine environments they're not as common as uh, some of the other um, sedimentary rocks like sandstone uh, limestone etc but in locations they can be abundant there's large deposits in the mediterranean seafloor around canada michigan ohio the gulf states as well in ohio underneath um, Lake Erie, there was large salt mines, so that that's rock salt mines. Um, this uh, evaporate environment provided that, so these large salt mines. So yeah, high evaporation rates of seawater can cause minerals to precipitate from solution. So maybe somehow sea levels drop, but there's some area of oceanic water that gets trapped based on the geology of something, and that water evaporates away deposits all its particles um, as they fall out of solution to create these evaporates. And if we find those, then we can kind of indicate that this is the environment that these um, formed in. Okay. So let's go ahead and pause there. And I think when we come back, we just have one more video. Hmm. Interesting. So when we come back, we'll kind of put a, all of this together to look at some just some examples on interpreting depositional environments when we're looking at rocks. Um, yeah, I'll see you back here in just a second.